are continuing our Christmas series here at the church talking about the gifts of God. Today we're talking about the gifts of love. So open with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and follow along. With that, would you take out your Bibles? If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. We're going to open this morning to begin our study together in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. So if you open to near the end of your Bible... And go to the left, you'll find First and Second Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to read from probably a somewhat familiar passage of Scripture. And uh, would you mind standing with me? We stand for the reading of the Scriptures together. First Corinthians chapter 13, and we will begin right at verse 1. Like I said, this may be somewhat familiar to some of you. There, the Apostle Paul writes, "...though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels..." But have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. God, I pray that you would give us some um, insight and wisdom as we... Lord, consider your gifts today, and, and obviously the gift we're thinking about as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the gift of love, and I pray, God, that you would minister to us as we think on the truth of the gift of love, as we think about the way that you have loved us and what your love for us means for us, what it does in us, and what you desire to accomplish through us as a result of it. So God, would you speak to us today? We pray that you'd meet us here. We trust, just as you said, Jesus, that wherever two are gathered, two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in their midst. So we, we're grateful that you are here, and we pray, God, that you would minister your grace as we minister to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all those that agreed said, amen. amen. You may be seated. First Corinthians chapter 13, this pretty well-known passage of scripture, well-known even to people who maybe don't read the Bible very often because uh, they may have heard it at a wedding or they've seen it on a poster somewhere, a bookmark, a very familiar passage of scripture. But it, it finds itself right in the middle of a passage where the Apostle Paul, who wrote this passage, is dealing with what are called the gifts of the Spirit. And when we talk about the gifts of God, as we are in this series right now, a lot of times that comes to mind, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul begins talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, things like the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and prophecy and miracles and all kinds of different things that he lists there. Uh, we're not really talking about those in this series, but that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We do believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still in use today here at Cross Connection Church. We, we believe what's called continuationism, that God continues to work by his Holy Spirit. But Paul kind of sets the stage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 on what the gifts are. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he talks about the exercise or the use of those gifts within the church. And then right in between those two passages is this that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And if you look at the verse that comes immediately before 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so that would be 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, Paul there says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he leads right into talking about what I would say is maybe the best gift, the most excellent way, and that is the gift of love. So this Christmas season, as we're leading up to Christmas and just 10 days or so, we are talking about the gifts of God, and Pastor Jason began this series talking about the gift of gratitude a couple of weeks ago, and today, obviously, we're going to be talking about the gift of love, and I shared last week that the gifts of God are gifts that God has given to us, good gifts, because every good and gift, perfect gift comes from above, it comes from our Father in heaven, and they are given to us for our enjoyment. And they are given to us for the praise and glory of God, and they are given to us so that we can be, with those gifts, a blessing to other people. And so we, we saw that with gratitude a couple of weeks ago as Pastor Jason was talking about that. We're going to be talking a little bit about that as it results, as it has to do with love today. And as something of a, a grounding statement for this passage having to deal with love, uh, let me propose that love is a good gift that God 
has demonstrated and given to us, and he has given it to us for our joy, and he has given it to us to bring praise and glory to him, and he has given us love to be able to be a blessing to others as well. Now, before we get into what the Bible has to say about love, I want to rewind for a moment and, and, and consider, you know, we, we live in a culture here in the West that over the last four or five hundred years as a result of, you know, kind of Renaissance thinking and Enlightenment thinking, we live in a, a highly scientifically oriented culture that is very scientifically reductionistic. What I mean by that is we basically take just about anything that we can think of in life and we have a tendency of breaking it down to its constituent parts and trying to explain it naturalistically. We try to explain virtually everything in a naturalistic sort of mindset. And so when it comes to love, we have a way of kind of reducing it to biomechanical, uh, biochemical mechanisms. And, and so, you know, this last week as I was thinking about this, I, I went in onto Google and I typed in the question, what is love? And if you do that, the first thing that's going to pop up is a really terrible song from 1993 by a guy named Hathaway called What is Love? Um, baby, don't hurt me. Baby, don't hurt me. No more. You know, you know this thing. It's a terrible song. So but that's the first thing that pops up. But then after that comes a whole bunch of scientific articles about what is love. So I went in and I started reading from Harvard Medical on love and it's kind of it's, it's interesting, science trying to explain love. Uh, you can be the judge on whether or not they do a good job of it. According to science, love can be broken down into three categories, each characterized by its own set of hormones. So the first is lust, characterized by testosterone and estrogen. The second is attraction, characterized by dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And the third is attachment, characterized by oxytocin and vasopressin. So what is love? Well, according to science, love, it's just the biomechanical interactions in your body and your brain's response and reaction to the presence of these chemicals, these hormones, and that is love. That just explains it all perfectly, right? I mean, that answers the deep question of what is love in every way or not. Uh, Really, it, it, that scientific explanation, it doesn't really produce any sort of hormone response that elicits any like desire, like, oh, that's wonderful. It leaves something to desire when we look at that. In fact, as I was reading through that, what came to my mind was something I had read many, many years ago. Um, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart in 1964 was writing a court opinion as the court was trying to make a decision, the United States Supreme Court was making a decision having to do with obscenity and pornography. And when, when he was talking about obscenity, he was saying, talking about de defining or describing what is obscene and what is wrong. And he made the statement in his opinion at that time. He said, it's not easy to describe or define, but I know it when I see it. And I think that there's some truth as it has to do with love as well. Because if we were to ask every single person in this room this morning, what is love? And we went around and we started to talk about this, there would be a lot of different ideas. And none of us would probably have a very good definition or description or explanation about what love is. That's why probably science has a difficult time trying to explain it. A lot of times they're just looking at the facts. They're just looking at what they can observe. But it's very hard to describe what is happening in our soul, really, you know, we believe that there is an immaterial part of humanity called the soul, and, and that's where we experience these things called love or the emotions that we experience. And these things are very difficult to describe or define, but we know it when we see it, or we know it when we experience it. We know love when we feel the love of others towards us. We know love when we are extending that love to other people, even though we may not be able to clearly articulate exactly what it is. And just reducing it down to what we see happening within the brain or within the body biochemically does not answer it at all. It, it just is an insufficient way of explaining or dealing with the issue of love. Now, the Bible, interestingly, somewhat like science, it basically speaks of love in three categories as well. When you start to look at this concept of love scripturally, you find that it also has basically three categories in which it talks about love. The first is identical to science. It's lust. 
And when we are reading in the New Testament, we do see this form of love. It is oftentimes the, the word that is used in the New Testament is a Greek word, epithymia. And sometimes we'll see a Greek word, eros, from which we get our English word, erotic. It's kind of the romantic love. And so we do see that category of love in the scriptures, a deep desire, a longing, or a lust would be the word that would come to mind, even though that's a word that maybe doesn't describe it perfectly. So that's the first form of love that we find in the Bible. The second that we would find in the Bible is what we might call affection. And there are basically two Greek words that would be used to describe affection. One of them is used in the Bible quite frequently. It's the Greek word phileo. And phileo is brotherly love or tender-hearted affection. And a very similar word to that in Greek, it's not used in the Bible, but it's an ancient Greek word, storge, and that speaks of familial love, the kind of affection that you have for brothers, sisters, family members, and so that's that affection. So we have lust, and then we have affection, and then the third form of love that we find in the Bible is the love that is being spoken of here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul speaks of the importance of this more excellent form of love. And that third form of love would be devotion. And the word that is used for this kind of love is the Greek word agape. And if you're looking at a King James version of the Bible and you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it does not say love suffers long in this kind in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4, but it says charity. So the word that is expressing this devotion is a self-sacrificial sort of devotion, and Paul speaks of it as being the highest form of love. So when you look into the scriptures, you see that there are these three different categories of love. Lust, which is that longing and desire, epithymia or eros, then affection, brotherly kindness or brotherly love, tenderheartedness towards people, that's phileo and storge, and then agape, this deep devotion, self-sacrificial devotion. Now, in the, the last century, um, C.S. Lewis, a great philosopher and author and professor at Oxford, uh, he wrote a book called The Four Loves. And in The Four Loves, he writes this. I, I found it kind of fascinating. He says, without eros, lust, none of us would have been conceived. <laughs> right? Without eros, none of us would been, have been conceived. And without affection, none of us would have been raised. There's so much truth there. He's making the point that all of these are important. You see, sometimes we can throw these aside and even say like, well, lust is wrong and bad and we gotta get rid of that. But there, there is a sense in which, listen, no, within the confines of marriage, it's very important and good. Without it, none of us would have been conceived and without the tender-hearted affection, that brotherly love, that phileo, none of us would have been raised. And I would add to that, without agape, without devotion, None of us, or all of us, would be damned. None of us would be saved. And so when we start to look at the concept of love, not just scientifically or not just culturally, but biblically, we find, point number one in the outline, the gift of love is essential for life. It is essential for life. And I believe that this is true from the initial act of creation and for every true act of procreation, that the gift of love is essential for life. God created, I would suggest, as an expression of his nature. He created Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, everything the Bible says, everything that is seen or unseen is all created by God. And he created as an expression of his nature. And in 1 John chapter 4, we're told that God's essential nature is love. God is love. So God creates as an expression of his nature. There would be no creation. There would be no life if it was not for God's love for all things. And then procreation. We procreate as an act and an expression of love as well. That's why we call it making love. And the fruit of two individuals coming together in marriage, the fruit of their love is children. And so we see that every act of procreation is an expression of love. So it is clearly true to say that the gift of love is essential for life. Without love, there is no life. And I think it is important to call to mind that Christmas is an annual reminder for us just as is Easter, and we'll talk about that in several months, but Christmas is an annual reminder for each and every one of us of God's great love. The celebration of Christmas 
is the celebration of the incarnation. It's the celebration of God coming into this world to extend his love. And the very fact that God came into this world in the form of Jesus Christ is an expression of God's love. You probably know the most famous verse of the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16. What's it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the fact that Jesus came into this world in the incarnation and for the crucifixion and the resurrection, all of that is an expression of God's love. John chapter 3, verse 16 says it really clearly, but also John says it again in 1 John chapter 4. If you are in 1 Corinthians still, keep your finger there, but turn to the right closer to the end of the Bible to 1 John chapter 4. It's right near the end. Open to the very last book, Revelation. Turn back a few pages, you'll find 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, we see here again restated this truth that the coming of Jesus into this world, the incarnation, which is what we celebrate when we're celebrating Christmas, is an expression or a demonstration of God's love. John chapter 4, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested. Manifested means to be revealed. Just like when you have a Christmas gift and you don't know exactly what it is, you have to open it. You have to manifest what's inside of it, reveal what's inside of it. Well, Jesus coming to this world is the revelation of God's love. He says, in this, the love of God was manifested, revealed toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and did what? sent his son to be the payment, the propitiation for our sins. So when we see Christmas, when we think of this holiday, which is the celebration of the coming of Jesus into this world, the incarnation, it is an expression of God's love. It's the revelation of God's love for us. And though we may not be able to perfectly describe or define or explain what love is, we know it when we see it. Point number two on your outline, the gift of love shines in the incarnation. The coming of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas is the shining forth of God's love. It declares to the whole world just how much God loves us. Now, typically, when we think of God's love demonstrated, we call to mind the verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where it says that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So a lot of times when we're thinking about God's love demonstrated for us, we think about Easter. We think about Good Friday, the crucifixion, and Resurrection Sunday when Jesus raised from the dead. That's the demonstration of God's love for us. But it's worth noting that there would be no cross, there'd be no Good Friday, There'd be no Resurrection Sunday without the incarnation of Jesus coming into this world. So the coming of Jesus as that little baby boy in Bethlehem is this beautiful demonstration of God's love for us. So what's love got to do with it? Tina Turner asked. Everything. It's got everything to do with it. It's all about the love of God coming to this world. Jesus made himself of no reputation. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of man, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. All of this is an expression of God's love for us. Now, there are many Christians, and maybe you're one of them, that has a difficult time with the Christmas holiday because of the, the commercialization of Christmas. And... I can understand the concern. Even if I don't entirely share it, I can totally understand the concern over the commercialization of Christmas. The, yesterday, my family, we were celebrating our daughter Addison's 10th birthday. And so as a part of the celebration, we went down to the Civic Theater in San Diego to see the Nutcracker. The girls were really excited about that. The boys, not so much. Um, <laughs> So we went to go see the Nutcracker, and when we were done, we're getting back into the Suburban to come back home, and we've got the little DVD player thing in the car, so the kids ask, can we put on the movie? So we turned on the movie, and what was on was Charlie Brown Christmas Story. How many of you guys know Charlie Brown Christmas? Oh, of course. And you may remember, I, I can't watch it. I'm, I'm driving. I was not watching the movie, but I'm listening to the dialogue and reminded of that scene in the movie, which I can't see it. I don't know what it looks like, but I know what Charlie Brown says. Doesn't anybody know what Christmas is all about? 
And what is Charlie Brown frustrated about? He's, he's frustrated about the commercialization of Christmas. This was made in like 1958. So if you think this is new, this is not new. It's gotten a lot worse, maybe, <laughs> exponentially so every single year. But certainly there are a lot of trappings, there are a lot of attachments, we might say, that have been hung onto the Christmas holiday. But amidst all the joy and celebration of this holiday, we need to do our best to remind people that this holiday is all about the love of God as demonstrated in the coming forth of Jesus. Point number three on your outline, the gift of love is the gift that is Jesus. And and it has become cliche, but the old saying is true. Jesus is the reason for the season. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that it's become cliche. Because people at least somewhat know it, even if it's way at the back of their minds, and the thing that's at the front of the mind is Amazon Prime and, you know, lines at Target, whatever it may be. I, I don't know. But yeah, all those other things can cloud this reality. But we who know this to be true and understand what is the implication of the coming of Jesus to this world, we need to do our best to bring that up to the people we interact with. You know, one of the wonderful things about this time of year is the fact that we're going to end up at holiday parties, whether it's Christmas parties for work or it's family gatherings. And it's highly likely that when you gather together with friends and family or coworkers at this time of year, that there's a number of those people that don't really know the truth of what this holiday is all about. I was watching a documentary, I think it was about a year ago or so, and it was pretty interesting about how in China, Christmas has become a really big business. You know, they've been creating all this stuff that they've been shipping over here for us to buy for a really long time, and they also have gotten into the holiday cheer. They like this American holiday called Christmas, but over there, it's entirely about Santa Claus and bells and Christmas trees, and there's a lot of people that have no idea whatsoever what it's connected to. And it was very striking. I mean, the whole point of this documentary was pointing this out, that here you have this retail industry in China, not just here, but where they have totally bought onto this American holiday, and they love this whole thing but they have no idea what it's connected to. And I want to suggest to you that there's a whole lot of people here who have the same problem. They they may have heard or known the story a little bit, but they don't know the real weight of what it's all about. So we have an incredibly great opportunity. And so I would encourage you in a good way to be opportunistic in, in looking for those opportunities to share with people. Because as you gather together, there's going to be people who just don't know the reality of what this is all about and that it is a demonstration of God's love. You can say, listen, that whole thing that happened in Bethlehem and you've seen the little nativity scene and maybe you understand or know a little bit of the story of Luke and all that sort of stuff, it's all about the love of God, that God loves you. And I think there's a lot of people that need to be reminded that God loves them. Because there's a whole lot of people in our culture today who are rejecting a certain form of God that is an angry, upset, kind of cranky old man God in the sky. And and I reject that too. That's not how God is revealed or how God has revealed himself in the scriptures. God has revealed himself in the scriptures as the God who loves, who loves us in spite of who we are. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, God saved us according to his love. The manifold love of God. Read Ephesians chapter 2 and you will see it very clearly expressed in that passage. So, love is a good gift from our good God, demonstrated, given to us for our joy, for the praise and glory of God, and for the blessing of others. Jesus is the gift of God, the gift of love given for our joy. It's been a popular Christmas song for a very long time. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. The advent of Jesus into this world is the advent of God's love coming to this world, bringing joy. It's the coming of joy. This is most clearly pictured in one of the classic Bible passages in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9. Would you turn there if you could? Open to about the middle of your Bible. You'll probably be somewhere around the Psalms. If you are, turn to the right. You're going to find a big 66-chapter book called Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. As you are turning there, a little bit of context to set the story for what's going on, because we're going to begin reading at verse 1. Verses 6 and 7 
are very classic Christmas verses. You may have seen them on a, a Christmas card before. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That whole passage is a very classic Christmas passage. But the, the verses that precede that, beginning in verse one, are really, really important. Now, this was written about 2,800 years ago by a man by the name of Isaiah. He was a prophet in the nation of Israel. And at the time that he wrote this, the nation of Israel was a divided nation. The, the nation was split in two. There was a group of tribes. The nation of Israel was made up of 12 tribes. 10 of those tribes had kind of broken off from the two tribes in the south. And those 10 tribes were in the northern part of the nation of Israel. They were called Israel. And there were two tribes in the southern part of the nation of Israel. They were called Judah. And Isaiah lived in Judah. And at the moment that he's writing this, the northern 10 tribes were about to go through a really bad period of time. In the 8th century BC, 2,800 years ago, the Assyrian armies moved into the northern 10 tribes and completely obliterated the nation of Israel. They became, at that point, what's called the lost tribes of Israel. They were exiled to Assyria, split all around the Assyrian empire, and effectively destroyed. So the northern 10 tribes, the region of the nation of Israel called Galilee, that group of people 2,800 years ago was about to go into a really dark period of time. And Isaiah, he receives this prophecy from the Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. We read this. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. What's Isaiah saying? He's saying, listen, darkness is going to come to the people in Galilee. Zebulun and Naphtali were two tribes of Israel that were in that part of the world or in that part of the nation at that point in time. He says, darkness is about to come. The Assyrians are gonna come and wipe these people out. But that darkness is not going to be forever. Verse two, the people who walked in darkness, those people who were in that oppressed part of the world, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That darkness is not gonna be forever because those people are gonna see a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And so Isaiah says, they're going to go through a dark period of time. It's going to be very, very oppressive and difficult, but there's going to come a light that is going to shine. That's the first indication of this wonderful thing that's going to come. A light is going to shine to those who are in darkness. Verse 3, you, God, have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. This light is going to come to shine to those who are in darkness, and it's going to increase their joy. They rejoice before you, God, according to the joy of the harvest. What kind of joy is it going to be like when this light shines to those who are in darkness? It's the joy that's associated with the harvest. That's probably pretty likely that there's not too many farmers in the room here today. And so connecting to harvests, maybe we don't understand the joy of the harvest, but it's kind of like this. Imagine for a moment, you got a really big Christmas bonus. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, maybe you'd love to, but imagine you did. Imagine it was like five digits big. That kind of joy. That's like the joy of the harvest. He says, so this light is going to shine to those who are in darkness, and it's going to increase their joy like when the harvest comes in, like when you receive a big, huge bonus. But it's not just like the joy of the harvest. He says in verse 3, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Who receives the spoil? To the who? The victors go the spoil. So imagine if you're in a battle and you're the winning side and you bring in the spoil. It's going to be that kind of joy. And that kind of joy is going to come from this light that's going to shine to those who are in darkness. And what else is going to come? Well, verse 4 says, For you, God, have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. So God says, listen, you're in darkness now, but light is going to come and shine to you. And this light is going to increase your joy exponentially. And this joy-increasing light is going to release you from the oppression of the enemy. All of those things are going to happen. What is this light that brings joy, that brings freedom from oppression? Well, that's where verse 6 comes in. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from this, that time forward, even forever. 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Who is the child that is born, the son that's given clearly? That's Jesus. Jesus is the light that shines to those who are in darkness, freeing them from the oppression of the enemy and increasing their joy exponentially. Point number four on your outline, the gift of love in Christ brings great joy. That's why we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He is the one who will bear a righteous reign for eternity. This is why the message that the church has is called gospel. Gospel means good news. That's the message that you and I have. That's what we're able to bring when we interact with family members, friends, coworkers who don't know the gift of Jesus. We have this good news of the gospel. His coming means great joy. His coming means freedom from oppression. His, his oppression. His coming means the an endless reign of a righteous king. The gift of Jesus is the gift of love that brings great joy. And this gift is not meant to be kept secret. This gift is meant to be shared. Back, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where we started. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not love, I have become like a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. We, we can and do give good gifts at this time of year. We can have gifts, we can give gifts, but... If we don't, with those gifts, extend and share the love that this holiday is all about, we're missing the point. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have some time off of work and to be able to celebrate with family members and to be able to give and receive gifts. All of those things are joy-producing, happy, wonderful things. But if we don't, with that gift that we give to someone else, extend the good news of the gospel, we're completely missing the point of this holiday. So this Christmas, you, you may have a lot of gifts under a Christmas tree. If you're at my house, there's like 26 Christmas trees. You, I'm not kidding. Um, there's a lot. It's like a forest. But you may have a lot of Christmas trees and a couple gifts, or you may have a lot of gifts under a Christmas tree. You, you might have all of those things. And those things are wonderful. But we need to make sure that we share this great gift of the love of God that brings great joy and freedom from oppression, freedom from sin. Point number five on your outline, the gift of God's love in Christ is meant to be shared with all people. And this is a great opportunity every single year at this time of year to take advantage of that opportunity. We, we cannot miss the importance of this time of year and what it means, and the opportunity that it brings. And, and just so we would never forget the greatness of God's love in Christ Jesus, Jesus on the night that he would be betrayed by one of his followers, the day before he would be crucified, he had a meal with his disciples, and he gave them what we refer to as a sacrament. He gave them an activity to observe on a regular basis to remind them of his body that was broken, of his blood that was shed, to demonstrate love. We call it communion. And so today we're going to partake of communion, the bread and the cup, and Anthony and the worship leaders are going to come up. They're going to lead us in a song. Our ushers are going to distribute the bread and the cup in just a moment. I want you to hold on to the bread and the cup, and we're going to partake together in a few minutes. Father, I pray as we now prepare our hearts for this time of communion that you would, Lord, help us to have it fresh in our minds right now, what this is all about, what this means that we're doing. May it never become 
just kind of a meaningless sort of thing that we observe. May we always be reminded of the greatness of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us so that we could be restored to relationship with you, that all of this is an expression of your love and your grace. Jesus, you came to this world and we celebrate your coming at Christmas. You came for the very purpose of demonstrating your love on the cross. And so we wanna have that be fresh in our minds, especially since, Lord, you, you desire that we'd share that good news with other people this time of year and, and all times of year, but especially this time of year. So God, would you help us to have hearts readied right now as we worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name.